on myself. I don't want to spend uh, the majority of our time today talking about me. I want to spend it talking about what I'm passionate about, as, as Tamara mentioned, which is human factors. Um, she said it's a little known um, profession. It's becoming much, much more known, uh, especially within the regulatory industry. Uh, and it's something that each of the device companies um, is required to do uh, and works very hard to apply the science to our product development process, especially here at Medtronic. Um, again, here's a little bit more of my history. I've been doing this for over 20 years. Uh, I started um, at Gateway Computers. I don't know if anyone there remembers the, the cow um, boxes <laughs> um, the, the computers came in that actually was very near our college. I actually spent a couple of years uh, working there. Uh, from there, I received my master's degree and then went down to uh, Johnson Space Center. Uh, was privileged enough to work on the International Space Station project for uh, almost three years. Um, and then since then, I've done consulting and then the majority of my career has been in medical and laboratory uh, medical device development. Um, these first few slides are some of my favorites. It's one of those things that if I asked you before today what Human Factors was about, uh, the majority of you may not have been able to answer directly, but you all have a lot of experience with bad design. Now, I cannot take any credit for the lovely young lady you see here. This is a colleague, um, and also if there are any Yankee fans in the audience, I apologize. There's going to be a lot of Red Sox starting here. Um, but my colleague, who also has nearly 20 years of experience in the industry, um, he's originally from Connecticut, huge Red Sox fan. Um, he took his daughter, uh, I believe this was two years ago, to her very first Red Sox game. She was extremely excited. Unfortunately, it was 94 degrees, and they lost the game. Now, this frown is partially because they lost the game, but I think it's even more so because of when they got in the car after it sat there for three hours in 94 degree uh, temperatures, Paul, as a PhD scientist, could not figure out his controls. Um, now, this was a rental car, so he'd never seen them before, but at the same time, I, looking at this, I laughed out loud. Um, it's one of those things where it should be very easy for you to be able to turn on the air conditioning and understand, are you, you know, cooling the front? Are you cooling the back? What temperature are you cooling it to? Paul's a very smart guy, I promise you, and it took him a good five minutes with a very frustrated and angry little girl in the back seat. No one likes to be in that situation. My examples uh, hit a little more close to home back at the University of South Dakota, and I'll give you a couple of quick pictures. Here are some things. These, these doors actually exist, and it's one of those things where some very smart people probably were setting these up and were intending on something good to happen, <laughs> but unfortunately in all these cases it didn't. Um, people are very good at recognizing visual cues. We don't often read signs. So um, I'll look at the one on the upper right hand side where it says push, but the handles are, mm, I would say questionable as to whether someone would walk up and try to push those or would pull those. The one on the bottom, absolutely you would not push. That one's mislabeled. This example for me hits home because in the psychology building where I actually got my PhD, it has this. It's a poll. Now I will admit, especially at graduate students, you spend a lot of time there. So you have to get some enjoyment out of your day. So we would, in the beginning of each school year, we would sit there and we would watch and count how many people would walk face first into this door because they would not see the poll. They would assume it's a push. And anyone we saw that actually made contact um, with the door, <laughs> Uh, we assumed that they were undergrads or freshmen. Now, we did apologize when they came in the door. Um, for the folks who had been there a little bit longer than that, they did recognize it a little earlier, um, but it was because of habit, not because of the visual cues they were getting here. So the people who do these things need to understand exactly how the human is likely to interact with anything they're going to touch. And I'll refer to those today as kind of the human interfaces. What are the things that people are going to touch? Um, to start the talk, I want to give a, at least a fairly brief history on, on human factors in general, kind of where it came from, where it started, um, and how it was applied when it was first studied. The first thing, and this is one of the most famous books, if you ever took a class in human factors, you would be exposed to the Champanis book. 
um, apply to experimental psychology. I have a very small blue arrow up on the right. I will give a little better reference here as well. Um, originally, they were looking at industrial and military. Um, and for a couple of different reasons. Probably the most important being that it was, uh, those were two of the places where you had a, a fairly high degree of control. <laughs> People um, responded and reacted and were trained to do things in a, in a certain way. So if they saw mistakes, um, the assumption in general was that it was due to um, their capabilities. Uh, and they, so they wanted to apply or learn about how they could take advantage of if people are going to be exposed to the same types of controls, the same types of situations, and are expected to behave the same way, how can we design the elements they're going to interact with to help them understand and help them perform to the best of their abilities? Now, if you look in the book um, that I just referenced, um, take a look at exactly the content of this book. And what it shows you is a uh, very high level introduction is into statistics, which we could talk all day about the effectiveness and, and the application of statistics. Um, but I think the more interesting component of this is what they were studying and how they were studying. So the first thing we talk about is how we see. There are a lot of um, you know, important research that's been completed relative to the visual capabilities of humans. And it's important because as humans, we probably use um, or react to 75 to 80 percent of the visual cues that we get um, as the primary input to what, what we're going to do and how we're going to respond. So how we design and, and implement um, the visual aspects of the user interaction is extremely important. And everyone here has cell phones and computers and programs. I'm sure there's a, a fair amount of love-hate um, relationships with all of those things, things that you like, things that you don't. Um, a great portion of that is built on how it is, how it presents the information visually, because that's how we primarily interact with it. The other senses are also listed here, how we hear, speech, signaling, how we make movements. Uh, ergonomics and anthropometrics are also very important in, in how we're responding, because we may initially take in the information visually, but we're most likely responding to it based on some sort of motor coordinated um, reach or touch or push, um, there's always a physical action as a response to what we're seeing visually. Um, further in the book, they, they show things that are um, fairly subtle, but it can be um, incredibly beneficial if, if we take advantage of some of the visual characteristics that we can apply. On the top left, you see just kind of a standard alphabet. Um, it's very linear. I'm not sure exactly what font is, is used there. But if you look at the bottom, where they magnify the edges and ends, um, what was studied was how they can recognize or take advantage of changes in the form of the letters themselves. And what we found was that the recognition was greatly increased if we magnified, so increased the size slightly, and increased the ability to discriminate between the letters by um, introducing things like those little edges on the B or the D um, by simply improving the ability to recognize letters we can increase the ability and speed with which people read words or recognize alerts. On the right, and this is something as perfusionists you're probably very familiar with, dials with a bunch of numbers next to them, you can see um, the discrimination is, is shown in a, in a different form. So here, you see essentially the same scale on uh, the scale on the B, shown in the upper right, and C on the center there. If you need to have a high degree of discrimina discrimination, um, and that's at the one unit scale, um, you need to have those lines in there. It helps you understand exactly how far you are. If you're looking at trying to increase or decrease flow in one of your cases, you may want to know very specifically what flow rate you're at. And you want, to, you want to know that right now. You don't want to have to figure out, well, it's about halfway between, or it's about two-thirds, so it's probably a six or a seven. You don't have time for those types of decisions. So being able to increase the scaling and the size of the dial is probably very meaningful to you, and it's important to consider when we're designing these things. 
So now I'm going to go back in time a great deal, again, just to give you a little bit more history. Um, there were a series of time studies um, by Frederick Taylor. This is way back before 1900. And what they were doing here is they were trying to figure out who should be paid the most. So when they do that, that was based strictly on how much they could actually produce. So whoever was doing something the fastest was going to get the most money. And when they're doing that, they, they essentially created a very systematic way to study the motions and the interactions between the, the person, and in this case, drill presses and machine parts. What that resulted in was a listing of what is the left hand doing? What is the right hand doing? What are they doing? At the, are they doing anything at the same time? Is it, is it coordinated action? Is it differentiated action? What sort of things would they have to do? And what sort of things would they prefer to do with their dominant hand, right hand, left hand, or would they prefer to do things in a different order, even based on the instructions of the particular machine they were interacting with? And so this was the first attempt to systematically evaluate how a human interacted with, in this case, I would, I would make an argument, especially with the audience today, working with a set of instruments that are uh, not quite complex as we are dealing with today. Uh, I struggled with not taking this picture out, but it is um, a picture that was actually, uh, we see quite a bit in psychology. And again, um, this is dealing with something that we haven't touched on, which is why I left it in the talk, which is posture and, and how people are going to be seated, seated excuse me, um, or standing during the actual usage of whatever they're, they're dealing with, whatever they're interacting with. So we hadn't touched about, we haven't talked about that um, when we were talking about the studies of Frederick or the Champanis book, but there is some research that has been done relative to the, the capabilities and preferences of seated versus standing work. And that's another thing that we have to consider, especially today. Um, I've seen the spaces that the perfusionists um, use in the OR. You guys don't get an awful lot of space. Um, it's very cramped. Um, you have to um, set up your equipment um, in a certain way so that you can see everything and interact with things as efficiently as possible, but you're not given a whole lot of space to do that. So it's important for us, especially as Medtronic, to understand the situation that you're going to be presented with, which can be a limited set of space or you know, a non-optimal configuration for you guys to be comfortable for what's likely to be an hour or two of your work. Um, to circle back a little bit on uh, visual organization, uh, and again, uh, given the perfusious environment of having to look at blood gases and having to make sure the flow rate's good and having to make sure that the surgeon is, is doing everything or happy with what's going on, um, interacting with anesthesiology and so on, you guys are presented with an awful lot of controls um, and an awful lot of settings, and you have to do a lot of scanning to make sure everything is exactly how you want it. Um, and so um, the earliest examples of this type of work um, is in the, uh, you can see aerospace on the right, and the left, those are nuclear controls, and in the middle is a different type of nuclear control. And these are organized um, in a very thoughtful way. I won't say it's done extraordinarily well, but the intent is um, they organize things by function or feature, and they try to keep the same types of controls organized closely together so that you can theoretically scan these things visually very quickly and see any changes um, just simply based on differences between uh, the sets of controls themselves. On the bottom, I have an example. So this one is, a, I think it's a four by eight grid. And in this case, everything looks good. Everything's pointing up. But if I changed it, how many of you see the difference between the first presentation? It's fairly subtle. There is a simple one arrow change um, on the middle on the right side not very effective. And even though I change direction um, on one thing, it's not likely to be seen, especially if it's presented with 20 or 30 or 40 other controls. However, if I change something that probably is a little bit more powerful visually, it's very easy to see where changes occur. And red is never good, but it's very easy to catch unless you're red, green, colorblind. And so um, the usage of color and the usage of um, in the bottom, I actually filled in one with black 
um, I wouldn't say that's necessarily a color change, but it is a form change. Moving from a white arrow to a black one um, is very easy to catch. Now you may still have to interpret the information or interpret what the change means, but we can attract your attention visually fairly easily. Ooh, a little faster than I wanted it to. Um, all the results of all these studies um, from way back in the late 1800s has resulted in uh, numerous standards for how to design any human interface that can exist. This is one example. Um, it's probably the most cited and the most used. It's the military standard. Uh, we call it 1472. Um, and this has all kinds of, if you're designing types of controls, here's how you should design them, types of instruction, essentially. Um, the middle page um, has high force controls. Um, and what that is, is much more um, in terms of operating um, equipment. Um, so yes, you have reach and you have a push pull type of control. So it will set requirements based on how much force can be applied based on how the person is seated and based on the type of anthropometric grip and pull or push motion that they're going to apply to the control. It basically tells you through years and years of study, um, can a fifth percentile female reach a control? Can she grasp it? Can she pull or push it? And it does the same thing for the 95th percentile male. So we can get a range with, or at least set an expectation for how our entire population is likely to be able to use um, the controls that we're designing. Will it be effective or not? And it goes down even to the point of, on the upper right, we see how can we design push buttons? So the size and shape. Again, I have all kinds of complaints, even on the phones that I like, relative to, you know, the screens can be so much so large, but what, what's the size of the screen? If you're texting, as an example, I don't know how many people in the audience feel that the uh, buttons are big enough or large enough to accommodate their fingers. Um, I would argue that we're going to have some competition between screen size and the ability to effectively include buttons, um, especially on things like our phones or even on controls of the perfusion systems that you guys have to deal with. But there are, there are um, instructions like this out there that give us at least a baseline for understanding, well, how big are these things going to have to be or should they be? How far apart should the controls be so that we don't accidentally activate something that we don't intend to? Um, we utilize these things during the design process as best we can to be able to um, lay things out and present the controls um, as efficiently and as, as, as effectively as we can. Now I want to get into something that's probably a little more closer uh, to everyone's heart here. This is an article that was published in uh, 2000. 13, late in 2013, that talks about medical error. And this is the big reason why the FDA has recently released its own version of its expectations for how human factors is applied in medical device development. Um, another one, 62366, uh, which is from the IEC, um, we'll talk about that here in a few minutes, um, but that's been out since um, early in the 2000s. So we have been expected, especially in Europe, to be able to apply human factors in, in the development of medical devices for a decade now, if not more. Um, and the FDA has just recently come out with theirs in the last two years. And this is why. Um, it's the ability to attribute medical error. And in this, in this study, they found it to be the third leading cause of death in the US. And that's important if you look at um, uh, the numbers and types of deaths that are, are occurring. Um, the reason that I pull this article up and I, and I talk about it all the time here at work, um, I, I think it's a good article, but in general I think they misattribute some of their information to a certain extent. Here's what the authors talked about in terms of medical error. Communication breakdowns, diagnostic errors, poor judgment, and inadequate skill. And I will not make the argument that those things do not occur. However, I will make a much stronger argument, especially interacting with uh, you folks and understanding your environment and the stresses and the types of um, uh, 
clinical decisions that you guys have to make, you know, often in, in a very short time frame. Um, the number and types of clinical cases that exist, um, that these are probably less of a contributor than some other factors that I would consider equally or more important from a human factors perspective. And these are the things that I would add to the list, and I think these are probably more important. Um, they don't understand these devices that are um, brought out to you guys. They don't understand um, how you guys have to work, the types of cases um, that you have to deal with, the number of hours that you're going to put in um, during a given day. Um, you may be at your best at 7 in the morning, but if you've been at 7 in the morning, you've gone through three cardiac cases, and two of which have been um, extremely long or extremely difficult or, or, or unique clinically. At the end of that day, you guys are very highly trained and you're very motivated and you're great at what you do, but it's hard. It's hard work. It's hard to, it's hard to continually provide 100% um, uh, accurately uh, complete your work um, uh, given, the, given the requirements of what's going on. So I think that increases the importance of the medical device community to understand this and understand how you have to interact with these things and do our best to um, optimize how we design the product to take advantage of your strengths, limit your weaknesses, or help you limit the weaknesses, and increase the ability for you to use the information and the controls and anything that's attributed to the medical device um, to the highest degree. And so when these devices come out, and I don't know how many, usually I can stand there, <laughs> this is the hard part about not being there, I can stand and look and I'll, and I'll see heads shaking about having, starting to talk about um, medical devices that have been released and presented to you guys, and, and you kind of shake your heads at, wait, how am I, how am I supposed to use this, or, or what am I going to do, or moving between this medical device and this medical device. People are going to prefer um, a multitude of um, different controls and layouts and settings and presentations, and they're, but you, you guys don't get to choose. You guys are forced to use what you're presented with. And so if we don't understand how you're going to use it, or how you prefer to use it, or the limitations of your environment, or the stresses of your environment, um, I think it's, it, it's inherent that we're going to come out with a product that's, that's not optimal, and it's not going to help make your life easier. And that's what we need to do, is we need to make your guys' life easier. Here's how we do it. And so we are required um, to uh, validate um, that we have included the research required so we understand the users, we understand the environment, and we understand the intended use of the product. And we have um, involved the uh, intended end user during the development to optimize the design. And from a safety critical standpoint, we've eliminated the possibility of user interaction error um, to the extent that we can. We, there's not always a perfect design choice, so we're, we're not always to complete, we're able to eliminate all the possibility of error, um, but we can drive it down uh, substantially. Um, and as I told you, the, the 62366 version, the ANSI AMI, um, it says 2015, but that's been out for a long time. Um, early, early in the 2000s was the first release of that. Um, and that's what we've been, we've been um, driven to um, account for in our device development process um, for a very long time. And only recently, as the FDA come out with their own version, um, and this is probably going to surprise the entire audience that those, these two don't agree <laughs> necessarily. Um, at a minimum, the language that's used um, across each one is, is different. Um, the process that they're proposing is definitely not the same, but it is close. And the intent is the same. Um, both expect us um, during our submission of the device um, for regulatory approval that we can show that we have included interactions with the intended end user. We have studied um, the likelihood of the types of use errors that can occur, um, and we have d done our best, and we can validate that we have eliminated the possibility of, of those errors occurring. Now, up until the last four or five years, even before the FDA came out, they also included uh, procedural efficiency in there. Um, they've taken that stuff out. Um, which I find a little bit surprising. Um, not so much because they're focusing on use error and patient safety, and that's 
all that's in the, the newly released 2015 uh, version of 62366, and that's what the FDA focuses on as well. Um, what they're basically saying is that if it's not designed well from a procedural efficiency standpoint, then um, people aren't going to buy it. <laughs> so I don't disagree with that necessarily, but I would also say that um, I think some of those things should have kept in there because it increases the rigor of, of how and what we look at during the device development process, and I think they probably should have kept some of it in, um, but it kind of is what it is. So we do our best to design out anything that's considered important, um, but what I wanted to point out here is, is it's a highly regulated environment, and each device company is required to do this work. Um, and so I'm going to be speaking for the rest of this time about how Medtronic interacts with the end users. Um, and we do this on every single product that we develop now. Um, and I also want to encourage um, each of you to take part when you get a chance. Um, and we'll speak to that uh, near the end of the presentation. OK. So I'm just going to put all three here. The first example um, I'm going to show um, is the development of the delivery system for um, the core valve um, aortic transcatheter product from Medtronic. And what I'm showing here is the Medtronic uh, product development process. Uh, different dev device companies will use different terminology relative to the phases or exactly how and when they're doing some of these things, but I'm hopeful that they're all very similar. Uh, but again, I'm going to speak strictly to the Medtronic process. So here, um, in phase zero, you see on the upper left, you see the core valve product. Um, now, what's important to remember here is those are nitinol framed heart valves, and which, which require a, a fair amount of force to be crimped down onto the delivery system. They function very well when they're in the form that you see there, but to be delivered to the patient, they have to be crimped down to a very small um, sheath and held on to um, uh, the delivery system for yeah, a fairly extended period of time. And so what Medtronic did um, was we started to determine through processes like the task analysis and the designing and prototyping, what sort of things are they going to be required to do? Um, and how are they going to prefer to do them? And who is going to be the one who is responsible for performing each of the tasks? And so across the product development process here, you see all the varying things that we're doing. And to a certain extent, um, simulating as much, essentially allowing them to put their hands on it because that's where we learn the most. Allowing the user to interact with the prototypes that we've produced to see are we getting it right or are we completely missing the boat. Here was the product um, as it first started. Um, and they were actually implanting patients with this uh, uh, delivery system. And there weren't um, problems with it, but people weren't um, happy exactly with the performance of this. And they felt, boy, this, 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 the valve itself, once it's implanted, performs very well. But there has to be a better way to get the valve implanted. And what my colleague, and I worked on this project, but again, my colleague with the very pretty young lady that I presented earlier is the one who, who led the effort. What he did is he went back and he created a task analysis that looked at for every single step of the procedure. What are they looking at? Is it something that's visual? Is it something that's tactile? Um, and who's doing it? And where are they doing it? And essentially um, completed a high level task analysis, which is the document you see here. And we'll go down and, and it's a bit of an eye chart, so we won't go through each individual step. But I'm sure uh, the majority of the audience that's there um, has obviously taken part in some sort of transcatheter um, aortic implantation. So these sorts of things are, are fairly familiar to you guys. What they found was that um, while this original delivery system was able to get the valve where it needed to go, yeah, there, are, there were huge opportunities for improvement. What Paul, um, my colleague, was, was really focused on was, okay, if, if this valve is crimped down very tightly onto the delivery system, what sort of user interactions are required to help them um, make sure they place it exactly where they want to place it? And I, I won't go into a lot of the CNAs and a lot of things that they're looking at, per se. What was more important to him was more the, the tactile and ergonomic 
aspects of the delivery system. And again, what he's looking at there is for a single operator. If there weren't very many places that wanted to have more than one um, surgeons or interventional cardiologist hands on a delivery system at a time, always wanted to be one um, operator. Understanding the strength of the human hand and the ability to hold the delivery system, what sort of actions could take place to be able to deliver um, the valve exactly how they wanted to do it? The thing that I, that I want to point out here, and I thought that was very funny when we were talking about this presentation originally, was you notice there's a big red strike through the automated. Not a single person we talked to wanted there to be any sort of automation. They wanted to be able to feel aspects of the procedure. It was extremely important for them to understand when step one was happening, when they were removing a sheath, as an example, or when the, the valve was starting to be deployed. They needed to have an understanding, not just visually, but how that also contributed to their touch and feel, um, as well as their ability to actually do that in a very controlled fashion. And all the things that you're seeing here are a number of different ways that you can complete the action. A lot of fancy words like orthogonal, wheel stationary, side mount, and so on. But it's how are they holding it, and how are they going to want to actually release the device. And so they went from that to um, what has become some of our best friends here at uh, Medtronic, which is the 3D printer, <laughs> and printed out a number of different options and started putting it in their hands. And what you're seeing on the pictures on the bottom, um, the, only, the only face that's not grayed out on there, by the way, is, is my colleague, Paul. Um, and so we're kind of protecting the innocent there, and, and I left Paul's face um, <laughs> presented, um, is a simulated use. So we don't have any patients on the table, but we do have a simulated patient there. And what we want to do is we want to bring in the most experienced um, surgeons to a certain extent, but in this case, it's more interventional cardiologists, and have them put their hands on these and say, well, which ones of these things would meet your postural and um, tactile needs? And then started to walk through where they had preferences relative to each step of the interaction. Does this type of control work better? Does this type of control work better? And there were hundreds of trials that they were using these to try to determine which sort of things were the best. And then they would make um, fairly small changes based on the down selection. Now, what we found for actually fairly quickly, relatively speaking, was that the thread concept, uh, either their ability to simply turn it, rotational um, interaction, was much, much preferred. And once we started getting to that level, what we started to do we, was we started to break down, okay, if this is the type of control that we're going to be using, what types of um, validation criteria are we going to have to account for this to make sure that it's being used safely? And so well, we've down, now we've down chosen to this type of control. The number of turns become important. Deployment accuracy is always important. How many times do they have to look down to ensure that they're, they're doing what they need to be doing, that sort of thing? And that's how we validate that they're able to use it as we intend for them to use it, and they're able to perform each one of the tasks that are specified safely. And again, this is just a picture. There are all kinds of different types of rotational controls. So we had, you see three prototypes up on top. Um, again, 3D printed, they're not, they don't look pretty, but they do perform the tasks as, as exactly how they're intended. And you see all the different types of hands. We had hundreds of different interactions it wasn't just three people who were telling us what, was, what needed to be done. Um, it was in the orders of 100. A number of conferences, a number of people coming into our internal facility and, and performing the tasks to make sure that we were doing what we we're supposed to be doing. Then we finally did it, got away from the 3D printing, and actually had a, a few that were produced, our first builds. And then there you see a much better view of the um, uh, simulated patient. And there isn't just one of those either. There are actually four, and those dealt with all different kinds of cases that were going to have to be um, completed using this device. And we went through and did, again, hundreds of implants, especially during validation, to ensure that the design um, completed all the tasks, all the criteria that we had just introduced there um, successfully. Now, um, as much as I like to talk about the interventional cardiologists and the surgeons and so on, um, I've done a lot more relative to software design. And this is some things that you guys have to deal with. Um, and so I want to introduce very briefly, I'm running out of time here a little bit, um, software um, and how we apply human factors to software design. 
the process itself doesn't change. We still, we're still have the same high-level goals um, of presenting information in this case, rather than the, the hand controls that we just went through in the examples with the delivery system. Um, how can we design software to make sure it best meets your needs? And here I'm going to be describing uh, the PaceArt system. Um, this is probably get, this is outside the OR, so this is a, be a little less familiar to uh, the audience today. Um, but what PaceArt is is a is a product that's used to track um, implantable heart devices, uh, ICDs, and pacemakers. Um, uh, it, it tracks the patient data um, as it's uh, brought in, either through a programmer when the patient comes in to visit a clinic, or through the online system. And we'll go. I'll introduce a couple of those a little bit later. Um, but this is the first picture I want to show you when, when I first started working on a product. This is literally what it looked like. Um, and I was shocked because this is, again, in the early 2000s, this looks like DOS to me. And this, is, this is really old school. And it hadn't changed. And it hadn't changed because um, it performed the functions fairly well. Um, it was just crude. Um, and it forced the users into a whole lot of interaction. Uh, the reason Medtronic was was moving forward with changing it is because it wasn't meeting their needs in terms of being able to do anything, and I, I'm going to underline anything, uh, efficiently and, and effectively. So I showed you all the hands and everything else that we did. In software design, um, it doesn't change the need to interact with as many users as possible. These are all in each one of the phases that we went through. Here are all the places that I went to visit. Um, and so we talked to as many different people as we could. Um, you all are exposed to very specific preferences and how ORs are run. Um, I'm sure you guys have a lot of discussions amongst yourselves relative to how one OR is run versus another, both good and bad. Um, but how the device clinics run, it's, it's similar. I won't say it's any more complex or, or less complex, um, but there are differences between how each, each place wants the information presented, wants to interact with their patients, and so on. And so being able to go across the country to all these different places and see how um, different people want to interact with the software in particular, it was important. With software, it also gives us the opportunity to do things remotely, just as I'm doing things today. Um, but I will say this, and again, this probably won't shock anyone in the room, it is extraordinarily difficult to do a WebEx within, within a hospital <laughs> and to have folks within um, any particular hospital be able to do a WebEx. Oh, it was painful. Uh, eventually, we were able to figure it out, and we did some of these things remotely. Um, but even with software, I, we, we went basically all over the country to make sure that we um, learned as much as we could before we started development. And this is very similar to what I showed um, relative to um, the uh, um, system that Paul was working on primarily same exact phases, and we're still doing the same types of things. We're still doing the task analysis and designing and prototyping and doing our use error. Um, and I'm not showing all the ugly, and they were ugly, believe me, uh, in crude sketches of, of how the, the design or the layout of the information can be presented. Um, but here are just a couple different versions here. You notice we start in phase zero, and we probably have four or five different versions of that, and we go out and show 20 or 30 people, and they give us feedback, and we apply it to the design, and the, device, the design um, changes and matures, and hopefully becomes better. It only becomes better based on the interaction with the end user, because, you know, again, we have very smart people here within Medtronic, a lot of very good engineers, um, but we know a whole lot about very little, and that little is, is, is needed, it's needed um, interaction with you folks, because without you, we wouldn't know if we're designing this well or not. You've seen some of the work of engineers who haven't talked to the end users. It usually doesn't turn out very well. Um, the other thing I will say here is that we have, I mentioned uh, the programming system, the programmer inside the clinic, and then the online system. Uh, patients can um, send their information from home. Um, some of you may have um, family or friends or may have devices yourselves, um, and they're able to send information without interaction with clinicians at all. Um, so the same user may be using um, one system within the clinic, and they may have to go online and see a completely different system. So one of the things that Medtronic has done is it tries to um, reduce the amount of relearning or retraining across these systems. And so what we try to do is you try to make them look as similar as possible. So here, 
they're slightly different. One's within a patient, one is external from a patient. Um, but you'll notice that the, the usage of color, the location of the controls, the form of the controls is the same across multiple systems. And, it's, and that's intentional. We don't want you guys to have to learn multiple systems and well, for this one I go to the upper left, for this one I go to the lower right. Um, we want to increase efficiency and one of the best ways to do that is to design systems that are for the same user or for similar uses um, to design them in a similar fashion so that you guys hopefully don't have to relearn it because I don't want to have to point you guys to an IFU or have a series of trainings every single time because every time you get a new person to come in, every time a new device comes out, you have to rely on those same mechanisms and they're not very effective. So this is my last slide. Um, I took you through a, a fairly quick introduction to kind of what Human Factors is, how Human Factors has been applied to the, to the design and development process here within Medtronic. Um, one of the important things and, and where I really want to leave you is we understand that, that there are huge differences between each individual clinic within the United States. There are, I can guarantee you, and you, again, uh, the audience I'm sure is very familiar, there are even larger differences between the U.S. and OU, outside the United States. Um, we have to understand all those differences. And so the only way we can do that is by interacting with the end user and having the people who are actually intended to use these products help us develop them. And that's the intent of the Medtronic development process. We want to have you guys involved. We need it. Um, because if we don't include um, the end user of the product as we design it, um, we're going to miss things. Or we're going to misinterpret what we think we see or what we think we know. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to leave you with today is if you get a chance, um, if, if you're recruited for anything, and Medtronic probably will be recruiting you, to help us understand um, what a new product may do or what a new version of an existing product may do or what it needs to do. If you have particular concerns or you have suggestions, we're all ears. Um, we do our job best. Um, when we get information from the people who are going to be using this or who are trying to save patients' lives, how can we make these things better? Um, and so I'll leave you with, if you get a chance to get your hands on some of these prototypes, 3D printed or not, or first version of a new software that's going to be put on um, one of your perfusion systems, please volunteer to help us out because your input will greatly, I can guarantee you, your input will greatly improve the utility of the product. Um, we value and we need your input. Um, and so with that, um, I will wrap it up. Um, and if there are any questions or any comments, I'll be more than happy to, to do my best to, to provide a little more information. can't hear the microphone, so we're going to, if you ask a question briefly, she I can, can... I can repeat can, it. Okay. I was just curious how they're addressing noise in their, or sound in their uh, development. I've used two cell savers and a platelet separator that the noise output approaches 90 decibels, which is pretty darn loud for an OR. I did not. Can you repeat, please? Yeah. Uh, you know, it is amazing where some of the questions come from. The reason I'm not there is because we're working on that exact problem right now. Uh, um, so relative to audio, um, there are a number of different things that we consider and we utilize two different laboratories um, to evaluate how much sound is um, added to the environment based on the usage of our equipment. So not all equipment has to be considered for auditory, but the cell saver actually is. And we're adding, what we're essentially doing is, is adding mufflers. And we're completing evaluations with an external lab to make sure that the decibel level, which is the loudness of the signal, and also the, the, type, of, the type of sound is decreased by a certain percentage. 
So we're lowering the decibels and we're lowering the type of sound that's made by the new cell saver. So we're actually doing that now. It's funny that you asked that question. Uh, a follow-up to that is, will it be incorporated into your PM uh, specs? That it should be under a certain decibel level? Yes, uh, it is. So there is, there is a new product requirement for us in the product development for how much sound is completed during each uh, interaction with the product. So if it's turned on, it can only be this loud, and it's applied to uh, a certain loudness, so decibels, and a certain range of sound, so the type of noise that comes out, and that could be the, the low bass tones versus the high types of tones. A more important, I would argue the more important sound consideration is the alerts and so on. Those, there are a huge set of requirements that are also attributed to both the auditory and visual um, inclusion of alerts. And so we have uh, an entire set of requirements, and each one of those is tested and validated both internally and at the external lab to make sure that we meet external regulatory guidance and um, user preference relative to just the normal operation. I have one question here from our webcast audience. Um, from the starting of a design to the finished product, what is your average time to get the product to market? <laughs> uh, be, I always be, wish it was faster. Be specific, please. <laughs> can, I, can I say it depends on the type of product? Um, it, it, it can be years. Um, and, and part of that is if it's, if, if it's a brand new product that's, that's very unique, the number, of, the number of requirements that's attributed, um, especially to patient safety, so the, the device, device delivery system that I showed, that's, that's extraordinarily long. Um, the, the shortest one will be even a year. And that's mostly because of the time it takes for us to submit it, um, complete all the work, and then get the, get the response back from the uh, regulatory agency so that we can start to deliver the product. The, the shortest one I've ever worked on in Medtronic was still right around a year, and that was a redesign of an existing product. Um, is there any coordination between um, med medical device companies um, to prevent hacking into software systems, particularly for um, ICDs and pacemakers? Yep, so very good question. The PaceArt, one of the biggest challenges for the PaceArt system was that it held information from any device manufacturer. And what we found out very quickly when we were trying to redesign the screens for that was that it may literally be the same piece of data, but Medtronic would call it something, St. Jude would call it something different, and Boston might call it something else. And each one of those things might be calculated in a slightly different way. So uh, we spent a great deal of time um, working with each one of the different vendors, and again, I, I want to give each one a lot of credit because they came to the table ready to work because they wanted the users to be able to see all their information for their devices. Um, they knew they were still going to use the software regardless. So um, we went to each one and tried to align as best we could, um, and then relative to the software, we had another external guidance called uh, Health Level 7, HL7, which is a standard for how things have to be called, um, what things speak to each other, that sort of thing. And so we were able to rely on the external standard to help us coordinate between all the different companies, even if um, something might be called different. We still knew what it generally was, and we were able to align with that and design the product accordingly. Thank you, David. Um, I think that's the end of the questions. We 